23 years later, and the man who has just unlocked the language of the Rosetta Stone lies unconscious in his brother's office. Having called for a doctor, Jean-Jacques desperately tries to revive him. He has encouraged and supported his brother throughout his life. When the younger Champollion was just nine years old, it was Jean-Jacques who arranged for his private tuition in Latin. It was 1799, the same year the Rosetta Stone was due to arrive in Paris from Egypt. Already hailed as the gem of antiquity, academics eagerly awaited the stone in France. It never arrived. In Egypt, Nelson defeated the French at the Battle of the Nile. With British soldiers at the gates of Cairo, the French petitioned for an armistice that would allow them to keep the Rosetta Stone and other treasures they had acquired. The British commander, Lieutenant General Sir John Healy Hutchison, would have none of it. Since the fate of arms has decided against you, I demand the execution of the surrender on this point. I demand all these objects, and you may be sure that I shall not let a single part of them leave for France. The Rosetta Stone arrived in London in 1802. The race to translate it was on. <laughs> Twenty years later, no one knows that Jean-Francois Champollion has finally unlocked the lost language of ancient Egypt. The last hieroglyphs had been inscribed just before 400 AD. But knowledge of the script died out after the Arab conquest of Egypt. By the time Renaissance travelers in the 17th century encountered the man-made mountains of the pyramids, Arabic was the language of Egypt. The strange pictures inscribed on obelisks and temples were thought of as magical symbols that could not be spoken at all. Champollion's fascination with hieroglyphics started when he was just 14. At the age of just 18, he was made professor of ancient history in Grenoble and the following year, in 1810, he had delivered his first paper on the stone. The inscription on the Rosetta Stone presents the Greek name of Ptolemy. It could not be expressed in the hieroglyphic part of this monument if these hieroglyphs did not have the power to produce sounds. Not just a written, but a spoken language, Champollion believed that hieroglyphs could create sounds. It was a radical proposition. <sighs> to 
today, 12 years later, Champollion has finally proved his theory. But since his breakthrough, he has remained unconscious. The first man since antiquity to read a hieroglyph has been rendered mute. Champollion had never been to Egypt, never seen a hieroglyph in situ, and certainly never seen the real Rosetta Stone. For over a decade, he had to base his studies on the engravings of hieroglyphs made by Napoleon's academics in Egypt. Frustrated by the copy of the stone that he worked from and by the lack of comparative material. At the same time, he was haunted by the fear of being beaten in his quest. In 1816, Champollion faced a significant challenge from a rival, worse, an Englishman. Thomas Phenomenon Young a physician, philosopher, and physics teacher. Young counted each time a word appears in the Greek text, found the Egyptian symbol that appears the same number of times, and assumed they meant the same thing. Splendid! <laughs> He successfully correlated the words and, king, and Egypt. But Young's guesswork could only locate words, not read them. Six years later, and Champollion has successfully read a hieroglyph. Quite how remains trapped in his unconscious mind. From reading the Greek section of the stone, it was assumed that the lozenge-like cartouche contained the name of Ptolemy. Champollion believed that the signs in the cartouche each represented a different sound. But he had no idea what each symbol sounded like. To enable and prove the decipherment of a word, Champollion realized that he needed to compare a pair of names in which the same signs recur. <laughs> 